So once again, um, welcome to this morning's toolbox session and a big thank you to those that completed the poll questions. I'm going to go ahead and end that poll right now. Um, we have a really great session put together today on commercial to residential conversion, and we're excited to have you all here. We've brought together a really wonderful group of panelists from the Central Puget Sound region as well as beyond, and we're excited to discuss the topic together. So before we dive in, I just wanted to take a moment to talk a bit about PSRC's Toolbox series. Toolbox is a quarterly webinar series that is designed to give planners another tool in your toolbox. And we're focused on sharing best practices and resources for local planning and implementation across the region. Um, I didn't introduce myself, but my name is Katie Enders. I'm an assistant planner at the Puget Sound Regional Council and I coordinate our toolbox series. So if you have any questions, ideas for future sessions, you could always reach out to me and I would be happy to chat with you. Um, a few logistics for today's meeting. You'll notice that today is a Zoom webinar rather than a regular Zoom meeting. What that means for you is that you don't have your regular chat function, but you will be able to enter questions in the Q&A box and we will be having a little bit of time at the end of the session for our panelists to answer some questions. We'll be asking you to submit those as we go along so we have a good um, set of questions to choose from. The meeting is being recorded today, and so that, as well as the slide deck, will be uploaded to PSRC's website probably sometime early next week. I'll be sending out an email to everybody that registered for the webinar to let you know when that is live. So we'll be getting all of this great information to you to review. Um, if you are an AICP certified planner, we have one credit up for grabs. And so I'll have more information for that at the end of the session. And then we'll also have our Title VI survey at the end of the session, as well as a just brief um, a few questions about how you think today's session went. So we'll ask you to stick around for that. I will highlight a few upcoming sessions that we have here in the next couple of months. We're going to have two toolbox sessions that are focused on TOD. So first at the end of September, we're going to have a transit oriented community session. And then in early November, we will be having a session focused on commercial displacement prevention. And again, both of these sessions will kind of be grounded in transit oriented development and how these topics relate. So we're really looking forward to that. And without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to Jason Thibodeau, who is our program, uh, program manager in economic development here at PSRC to introduce today's panel. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining. Great attendance today, we're really excited about this this session. Uh, we have five amazing panelists participating today. Uh, to start the program, we have a representative from ACOM who will provide a contextual overview of the topic, setting the stage uh, for the rest of the session. From there, we have representatives from the cities of Seattle, Tacoma, and Chicago who will talk more about office to residential conversion activities in their communities. And then finally, a representative from Main Street America who will offer a slightly different perspective on the smaller adaptive reuse projects taking place in the downtown cores of medium and small communities across the country. And as Katie mentioned, we're gonna wrap up at the end of the session with some Q&A time with the panelists. We also have the ability to answer questions as we go. So if you've got questions for panelists as they come up, please put them in there and we'll manage them as best we can. So let's get started with our speakers. Our first speaker of the session is Hunter Gillespie of ACOM. Hunter is an AICP certified planner who is a senior analyst on ACOM's Buildings and Places consulting team and is based in Chicago. Hunter has led several plans and studies involving office to housing conversion, including recent efforts in Chicago, Houston, Los Angeles, New York City, and Dallas. So Hunter, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to run through a quite a bit of content and I'm gonna go relatively quickly. Uh, I'm glad we're sharing the slides. So anybody that's on here can feel free to reach out to me via email uh, or LinkedIn uh, if you've got any questions about anything that I talk about. Um, and with that, let's dive in. Uh, this presentation um, is, is one that I've delivered before. It's been on a, a lot of people's minds. Um, I already kind of went through my intro, so I, I won't go uh, too much into that, but brief agenda. I'll talk a little bit about how we got here, why this is a relevant topic, why people care about it right now. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about 
uh, the problem itself, defining the problem, why this is so important. I'll touch briefly on some of my team's work, some of the projects that I've been involved in. And then lastly, uh, most of what I'll be talking about is what we've learned uh, throughout the course of several of those projects. So we can go ahead and continue. The first few slides here. Uh, so how do we get here? Uh, I think most of us are pretty familiar with this at this point, um, but we've got kind of a progressive flow chart here that shows uh, the, the kind of series of events that have happened over the course of the past few years, starting with the pandemic, obviously in 2020, a uh, big economic shock caused a lot of uh, changes in behavior in terms of consumers commuting. I think, I think we're all pretty familiar with the changes that caused. Secondly, um, those impacts had a number of kind of snowball effects, right? Um, office vacancies increasing, retail vacancies increasing in our downtowns as a result. Uh, housing and hotel markets were initially impacted, but um, then kind of quickly rebounded. Uh, and then we've kind of got these larger questions about downtown vibrancy and public safety uh, to, due to the lack of activity in some of these areas. The, the third column there in yellow, several complicating factors, um, adaptive reuse is complex and expensive, our interest rates are really high right now, um, our, our downtowns are uniquely impacted because of the, the use mix there, uh, so several things that we're familiar with. Uh, in light green there, the rebound and intervention, there's been a lot of stuff that's been happening, uh, which I'll we'll talk about in a little bit at the local, state, federal level, um, a lot of revitalization efforts, a lot of new public policy being developed and plans and things of that nature. And then lastly, the, the benefits of all of this activity, which we're just really starting to see um, anything from fiscal impact to public safety benefits to long-term resiliency and, and economic uh, resiliency are very important. So um, I think you can skip maybe a few slides ahead. I think I had kind of a visual progression here that I forgot about. Um, but yeah, that will get us to this slide. So now defining the problem. Um, again, I won't spend too much time here because I think we're all pretty much familiar with this. But uh, the big problem is that we've got fewer people going to our downtowns and other kind of office centric areas compared to what we had pre pandemic. So we've done a lot of data analysis looking at this very subject. Um, this particular chart is complicated, but I've hi highlighted Seattle here. We looked at downtowns across the country and we looked at cell phone location data that shows us how many people are visiting there uh, on a kind of day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. Um, and we've looked at how current activity levels compare to pre-pandemic. Um, and you can see that a lot of these downtowns are feeling an impact um, and don't have as much visitation as they did before. Um, so next slide. Uh, one thing that we noticed as we were looking at this data is, is there's a pretty high correlation between post-pandemic recovery trajectory and what we're calling here office dependency. So the number of visitors to the downtown that, uh, that were office workers compared to other types of visitors like permanent residents, tourists, uh, both local and non-local, things of that nature. So the, in other words, the more reliant an area is on office workers for its foot traffic, the worse it's doing right now because those people are not coming to the office as much as they were before. It seems intuitive, but it's really encouraging to see it start showing up in some of this data that we're looking at. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, um, you know, the kind of result of all of this, these behavior changes, market changes, is that we've got probably too much office space and we have not enough housing um, in major cities across the country. Housing vacancy is at an all time low. Costs are increasing very rapidly. Um, a lot of this presentation is talking about office to residential conversion, but there are obviously a lot of other things um, that could that we could be converting these these buildings to, and it kind of varies on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the problem that we've been trying to address here. So next slide. Uh, touching briefly on my team's relevant work so far, obviously Acom is a large company. I'm one person within that large company, um, but these are some of the projects I've been directly involved in uh, around the country that are kind of relevant to this conversion, adaptive reuse, post-pandemic market context uh, topic that we're talking about. So I've highlighted 10 of them here. Um, we've done things in Chicago, Washington, D.C., L.A., New York, Houston, Austin, uh, some things that are nationwide. Uh, just to give you kind of a sampling, I could talk at length about each one of these individual projects, but I think some of the later speakers will go into a little bit more detail. 
Um, but otherwise, the rest of my slides are kind of distilling all of this down and telling you what our key takeaways are and what we've learned, uh, which I hope will be helpful to you all. So next slide. Um, one question we get when we're talking about this pretty frequently is why don't we just demolish these buildings? You know, if they're if they're highly vacant, why don't we just tear them down and build something new that's, you know, kind of purpose built, intended for, for what its future use will be? The two reasons why we think adaptive reuse makes a lot of sense, even if it's maybe not the most economically feasible option, is one, historic preservation. A lot of the projects that we've been involved in have uh, been dealing with buildings that are on the National Historic Register, our local landmarks and things of that nature. Uh, so we don't want to just see them torn down and we might not even be able to tear them down even if we wanted to. So that's one big consideration. And I've got a few examples there of, of historic buildings that have had uh, adaptive reuse proposals. And then secondly, embodied carbon. Um, there's a large embodied carbon savings argument to be made for adaptively reusing a building. Uh, the idea being that you've got a lot of steel, concrete, uh, and other building materials already there on site, and you're saving a lot of carbon emissions in, by keeping them there and reusing them, as opposed to tearing it down, hauling all of that away, hauling in new materials. Um, and I think I think you get the point. There's there's a big environmental component to to this adaptive reuse argument as well. Next slide. Um, another thing we've learned, we've started to compile a list of these case study projects, the projects that have had proposals or actually have moved forward with these conversion projects from around the country. Uh, a sampling of them is listed here. This kind of continues to expand as we do work in other cities, uh, but we've had kind of a, a variety of key takeaways. We've looked at when they were built, how big they are, what their floor plates look like, what they were before, what they are after conversion, uh, how much it costs, if there was a sale that occurred, a lot of these kind of key um, data points about each of these projects, uh, and we've identified some patterns. Uh, you can see some of the cost metrics I've summarized there at the top. So 100 to 150 per square foot or lower seems to be the trend in terms of the sale price beforehand that makes these feasible. Obviously, there are market-specific considerations there, um, but that's kind of the average that we've been seeing. Secondly, the actual cost of the conversion or construction itself is usually between $250 to $450 a square foot. Again, varies from building to building. Uh, and that translates to a total project cost of three to $600 a square foot on average, um, which is still quite high um, and, and feeds into some of this feasibility equation that I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, next slide. As we've looked through uh, and, and studied a lot of these case study projects, um, we have compiled a list of challenges and solutions. I'm not gonna go through each of these. The first slide here is things related to the policy and market. So uh, talking about things like uh, balancing political community desires, um, specialization of office building owners and the office market and the, and the difficulties of facilitating partnerships between the current building owner and a developer that actually has the expertise to execute these types of projects. Um, talking about historic designation, zoning and land use regulations, there's a, a variety of things that make uh, a conversion project challenging, and, and we've uh, identified potential solutions to these through a lot of the case study projects that we've looked at. Um, and then on the next slide, a similar kind of arrangement of challenges and solutions. Uh, these ones are more tailored to the physical and structural elements of the building. Um, so there's we've seen several creative solutions for people solving deep floor plates or the sheer size of, of a lot of office buildings is quite large. So looking at vertical mixed use conversion programs and things of that nature. Um, and then some other kind of more specific things like column placement, elevators, sprinklers, means of egress, and other kind of code related things that people have to get a little bit creative to, um, to, to work around. So that's kind of the challenges and solutions. On the next slide, Uh, one type of analysis that we've done in a lot of different cities now is uh, a lot of our kind of public sector clients come to us and say, okay, we know this is a problem. We know we want to look at what our options are, but we need to find a way to identify the buildings that are good candidates for adaptive reuse or, or conversion. So we've developed uh, this kind of scoring methodology that you see summarized here. This can be tailored. Uh, this example is coming from downtown Houston, but uh, you know the scoring system for Houston might be different from Seattle, might be different from New York, et cetera. Um, 
But the idea here being we score a variety of factors um, on a scale of one to five, with one being uh, something that makes a building less favorable or less ideal for conversion, with, and five points being something that makes the building more favorable for conversion. Um, and the result of this on the next slide, um, an example from this same downtown Houston project is a list of buildings with each of these criteria scored, um, and then the total score on the far, far right column there uh, being pretty helpful in terms of identifying the buildings that are probably good candidates for conversion. So this can be helpful. Um, you can take this list and you can do a feasibility study with it, which is something that we've done. You can take this list and you can start reaching out to the building owners or prospective developers um, and kind of highlighting these buildings that, that have been identified as good candidates. Um, that's kind of another kind of action item that you can take away from this, um, but something that we've done in, in a lot of our projects so far that, that's been really helpful. Um, next slide. Another thing we've learned, um, big, a lot of questions about feasibility, economic feasibility. Um, you can see an example of some of the, the financial modeling that we've done in the chart there um, with looking at this kind of like layer cake of different funding sources that might be applicable depending on the project itself and what that kind of post conversion program is gonna be, whether it's housing, affordable housing, hotel, um, you know, ground floor retail, whatever it may be. Uh, a lot of different things that can be applicable there. So we've looked at that a lot. Um, but one one big question we get is, do these conversion projects pencil or are they financially feasible within our current environment? The answer is sometimes yes, but most of the time, no. Uh, a lot of the low hanging fruit buildings that are very, very, that are optimal for conversion have already been converted um, or in the process of being converted. And so what we're left with is a series of more difficult buildings that, that probably aren't going to pencil on their own in a lot of instances. Uh, another question that we get is if if that is the case, if the project is not feasible without any sort of public subsidy, how much and what types of additional funding are necessary to make these projects feasible? Or how how can we as public sector planners or um, you know people in, in our types of positions, how can we uh, support or encourage these types of projects and, and make them more feasible? And the answer, again, highly dependent on a lot of factors. Um, but we see a, a 15 to 25% uh, funding gap uh, in terms of total project cost or, or 50 to $125 a square foot. Again, highly dependent um, on, on a number of variables, but that's kind of the average that we've seen uh, across multiple cities and projects. Um, and those funding gaps can be filled with a number of financial incentives. Um, and I think we have a, a question that we'll answer about this later as well, so I won't go through them all. Um, but we've done, we've looked at different funding sources um, extensively, federal, state, local. Um, obviously, some of this, this equation changes depending on where the project is located. Um, but there's a lot of different things that can help make these projects work from a financial perspective. So, um, yeah, we've, we've looked at that quite a bit. On the next slide, um, the reason why uh, a lot of a lot of people ask, well, why why don't these pencil on their own? Why are they so expensive? Um, why do we need to subsidize these projects? And there's quite a few reasons why, which are uh, which are summarized here. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of these in depth, but you're you're free to look through them, ask questions um, as you see fit. Uh, but the the big ones are large deep floor plates. These buildings are really big. They're really deep. They're not very efficient on a, a net to growth basis, and that has an impact on this kind of feasibility equation. Um, historic preservation is a big a, a big piece of this. Building age is a big piece of this. A lot of these are quite old, have a lot of deferred maintenance, need a lot of very significant upgrades to windows or HVAC or uh, you know kind of any number of things that that can get quite expensive. Um, and then just costs. Obviously, we've I think we've all heard quite a bit of this over the past two years, but everything costs quite a bit more now whether it's construction, whether it's the sale price, um, just things just cost a lot. Um, and so we either pass those along to the tenants that will be living or, or staying here um, or, or renting space here, or we find ways to offset those costs um, by using some of the programs that I'll talk about here in a second. Um, on the next slide, uh, fiscal impact, another common thing that people ask about um, is, you know, is this something that we should be encouraging and subsidizing uh, and if if so we want to make sure that it's that it's smart from a fiscal impact perspective a lot of what we've looked at is 
property tax implications, um, but there's obviously a much broader uh, study that could be done about sales tax um, and, and other types of tax revenues. But really what we've looked at so far is property tax. You can see a couple of examples on the right there. Um, and generally kind of the rule of thumb, again, a lot of factors to consider here, but the general rule of thumb is that a healthy office building, yes, does tend to generate more property tax revenue than a healthy apartment building or hotel or, or whatever the, the kind of post conversion use is. However, um, you're not gonna be converting healthy office buildings, right? If it's 90 or 100% lease, you're probably not gonna convert to something else. You're gonna be talking about buildings that are not healthy office buildings. Maybe they're half empty or maybe they're entirely empty. Um, and that obviously has an impact on the value of that building. So we've seen across multiple cities, multiple example buildings, there is definitely a fiscal impact argument to be made for converting a highly vacant or underperforming office building to something else that is more viable. Um, and, and that will generate more property tax revenue in the long term. On the next slide, uh, I think we're getting towards the end here. Um, and I know we've just got a couple of minutes left, um, but we've done a lot of research into uh, what local governments are doing around the country to encourage these types of adaptive reuse and, and conversion projects. Uh, you can see it summarized there. I will say we've updated this a number of times. It changes basically week to week. There's like another news article about this new incentive program in this city. So um, this is evolving pretty quickly, but this is our best uh, our best stab at where we think things stand now. Um, you can see a lot of a lot of major cities are doing stuff here, um, and a lot of smaller cities are as well. Uh, a variety of financial incentives being offered, as you can see in the kind of lighter green column. The the big two that we see quite frequently are grants of various kinds and property tax abatements. Um, and there's some other things as well, but you can kind of see some of the different factors, like the percentage of applicability and the, the length of, of that particular incentive that vary a little bit between cities. Uh, and then lastly, the affordability requirement has been a big thing that we've been looking at. Um, so if, if it's an office to residential conversion, uh, most, most uh, jurisdictions want some sort of public return um, or public benefit to happen if, if we're gonna be subsidizing these. In addition to the revitalization uh, of the building and in, in the ground floor street presence, um, there's a there's a lot of cities who are requiring that what's happening higher up in the building in the housing component, um, a lot of affordability requirements that range from 10 to 25 to up to 30 percent um, affordability requirements. So that's kind of a key piece of the the feasibility and the funding landscape argument as well. And that's kind of the last slide. Um, happy to take questions. Uh, probably later on, um, which I think you, you can submit on the Q&A function. But uh, like I said, you're you're all more than welcome to reach out to me later as well. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Hunter. Um, and of course, there's lots of information that was presented in Hunter's slides. We'll have all that available for you to download and go through in more detail at your leisure. Um, as Hunter mentioned, we have a Q&A section here. If you have questions for Hunter right now that, that they could answer, please feel free to drop them in there. We'll have an opportunity a little bit later on to uh, talk with the whole panel about some questions. So our next speaker here, who's already on screen, hi Lyle, is Lyle Bicknell. Lyle is a Seattle-based urban designer, former, former principal urban designer for the city of Seattle. He continues to promote and advocate for urban design excellence, excuse me, throughout the public realm. Lyle is also an affiliate faculty member at the University of Washington's College of the Built Environments, where he received his architectural degree. So Lyle, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. after 27 years with the city of Seattle, I did uh, hang up my hat uh, last, uh, last month. Um, but before I'm completely out the door, I did wanna share with you what we've learned so far uh, about office to residential conversion. Uh, but first, a little background. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Seattle has been hit hard over the last four years. Uh, COVID, civil unrest, the fentanyl crisis, and perhaps most significantly, certainly for our discussion this morning, um, high numbers of employees uh, working from home. Now, much of the city has recovered over the last few years. Our Pike Place Farmer's Market is uh, doing great. Um, our new waterfront, uh, Linear Park, which will open up later up 
later this uh, year will be absolutely uh, terrific. Um, but our office core, our central office core is really hurting. We have uh, approximately 30% vacancy rate um, that compares to something closer to 20% for our surrounding uh, suburban uh, cities. Um, and all of this led to the conclusion that, that we needed to act and we thought one of the most effective ways was to host a competition, an ideas competition um, for uh, solutions regarding converting off commercial office to, uh, to residential. Uh, specifically, we didn't want a blue sky competition. We really wanted nuts and bolt proposals, including cost estimates, detailed, um, detailed plans, a, a detailed financial program, um, and importantly, we wanted the submitters, the uh, potential um, uh, uh, winners to uh, list uh, what impediments there are um, um, from a regulatory standpoint, um, especially uh, government policy that are um, in their way, um, what's making it harder uh, to, to make these things pencil. And with a kind of specific focus on codes, if there's any um, land use um, building code um, that we can address, uh, we thought this would be an, an effective way uh, to get some um, answers. Um, next slide, please. Um, fast, a very fast uh, competition uh, between uh, March when we announced and June 6th when we um, chose the, the finalists, the three finalists. So uh, that was, I think, an exciting part of this process. Uh, it, was, it was energetic and quick. Next slide, please. Um, we were also looking, in addition to the, the fast time frame, we were also looking for something of a unicorn in uh, the submitters in that we asked for the teams to be comprised of both a architect as well as a building owner um, and we wanted the, uh, the submittals, uh, the particip participants to focus on our traditional downtown area. Um, for those of you who know Seattle, that's between Interstate 5 and the water with and including our historic districts of Pioneer Square um, and International District. Uh, we did this for a reason. Uh, this was the area of the city that was really hurting the most. Um, it is our highest concentration of a large scale commercial. And we thought this is where we should really focus, um, focus our attention. Uh, we had 14 entries, which was great. <laughs> we weren't sure we were gonna get any, um, but three were chosen as exemplary. And I'd like to walk you through those right now. Next slide. Um, our first, pace, our first place uh, finisher was a very thoughtful project. Um, as we've discussed so far, um, uh, pre-war buildings really are great candidates for this kind of conversion. They have operable windows. They tend to have high floor to floor, um, um, floor to ceiling um, numbers. Uh, also, they just have the kind of natural charm of buildings like this located in our Pioneer Square uh, neighborhood. Uh, this is the Mutual Life Building uh, constructed in 1890. Um, it was a viable commercial building up until about 10 years ago, and it's been um, essentially vacant, vacant sen since then. What we liked about this proposal was, and this speaks to this challenge with conversion, that yes, you can convert uh, commercial to, res to residential, but those residential units tend to be very expensive. Um, and what we liked about this proposal is it did have a co-living component. Um, certain uh, uses like uh, kitchen, eating, um, general common area were shared. Um, and that did a uh, really a significant, uh, a significant solution to reducing the costs, the per unit costs of the, of the residential um, units. So that was our first place uh, finisher. And I think you can see it was imaginative and well, um, well thought out. Next si slide, please. This is um, one of two second place finalists. Uh, and this is the Polson and Western um, buildings, two combined warehouses on our waterfront. Again, um, pre-war, 
they have the advantage of being warehouses, which allow for a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of how you do the layout. And this one was particularly inventive because it combined um, office as well as residential. You can see they dropped the light well um, in the top to facilitate uh, you know, attractive, uh, engaging, inviting uh, residential units, added a penthouse, but then kept the lower floors um, for office. The other thing we liked about this proposal is it was replicable. We have a lot of this kind of warehouse structure on our waterfront, and it seemed like something that could even turn into a, um, a district. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, this was the other second place of, of finisher, and it was a post-war building. Um, we, I can't give the location, and that speaks to some of the challenge with this competition. A lot of building owners didn't want to enter because they didn't want to think uh, or, or uh, uh, give fear to existing tenants. Um, and so uh, this is an anonymous building, but if you know Seattle, it's in the north portion of downtown. Uh, fixed uh, fixed windows. It had a relatively good floor plate for conversion. Um, and they did some really imaginative solutions with uh, creating open space uh, where there was just surface parking um, on the backside of, of the building. So again, a good example um, of, a, of, a, of a challenging um, building typology uh, that um, um, was, was um, successfully, uh, could be successfully um, converted. Next slide, please. So what are some of the uh, uh, kind of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, if we can, oh, let's, yeah, this is good. Some of the conclusions that we've found so far are uh, that it, it makes a ton of, it makes a ton of sense. It avoids zombie buildings. Um, that's a real challenge when you've got a completely uh, vacant building in your downtown. It removes office space from supply, which is, that's a kind of a double benefit. Um, creates more housing. That's a, a huge interest right now. Um, and that is uh, certainly on the top of elected officials' minds. And so they're really supportive of, of this kind of thing. Um, and it also brings new residents uh, more vitality, um, more um, support to retail um, um, down, downtown. Uh, so for, for all of those reasons, there was a lot of press interest. Um, the mayor was very interested in this, and it's now part of our DAP, our downtown activation plan. Um, it's a component of, of that um, initiative. We asked developers um, you know, what, what could help them, and it was the usual response, uh, faster and simpler entitlement process, reduced or eliminated development fees, uh, relaxation or elimination of code requirements. <laughs> Those are kind of the standard responses that you get. Um, mod modifying our life safety code was really a non-starter, especially in a seismic um, zone like, like ours. Um, um, we don't require parking um, anywhere in our downtown. Uh, we did look at, and I think we are going to remove the requirement for design review since these buildings are essentially um, built. Um, and we have proposed re uh, eliminating needing to contribute to our mandatory housing affordability um, program. Um, that's a, a requirement of all new um, um, construction, but because we saw this as uh, super desirable, uh, we think that can be um, waived. So those are some of the things that, um, that we've heard and we've learned. Um, we did meet with our building code um, folks, and uh, again, they were very reluctant to look at life safety, but certainly, as Hunter mentioned, the embodied uh, carbon issue um, really provided some flexibility on the energy code side. So that is a place where we can um, um, really um, pro provide some some flexibility and encouragement. I will say we've not seen a stampede of proposals. I think this is going to be a component of a solution, but not a huge one. And I, you know, I think there's a, a clearly a place for these kinds of solutions, but it's not the silver bullet for all of our um, housing housing needs, especially um, especially down town. I pulled up this picture just because it speaks to the whole notion that we're really talking about adaptive reuse in general, um, and that's such a positive um, thing. Here's an example from Pioneer Square of a building that's actually been vac vacant for um, decades. And uh, you know, it's the kind of building that maybe warrants uh, more attention, especially if we're putting public dollars into the process. Maybe we want to be more um, selective. It also underscores the 
other challenge that we have right now, which is vacant retail, ground level retail. How do we um, how do we activate? You know, retail has typically been the secret sauce for urban design success, um, but now it's vacant, and that's uh, you know, there's nothing worse than a, a vacant retail at the ground level. Are there other uses? Are there other ways we can um, uh, activate our our, our, our ground level um, components of buildings. So that's a, a fast overview. Um, I look forward to answering questions. Um, I will say, you know, our, our job, our job is to plan for the future, but predicting the, uh, the future is a really a fool's errand. And I think we're gonna need to stay flexible. A lot of other countries have returned to work at a much higher rate than, than we have, and that could very well be in our future as well. So I think providing flexibility um, as we look at these, uh, these conversions, that's really um, our, our primary focus right now. Thank you, Lyle, for joining us. Uh, we've got a few questions in the Q&A already queued up. So Lyle, you can take a look and we're actively working to respond to those. Up next is Cindy Chan Rubik. Cindy is a deputy commissioner with Chicago's Department of Planning and Development, managing a team responsible for planning initiatives, city-owned land sales, and the planning and design review process for large-scale developmental proposals. Prior to her 18 years of experience with the Department of Planning and Development, Cindy worked as a licensed architect in Chicago. Cindy, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Jason and Katie, for having me. Uh, you can jump to the next slide. Thank you so much. I'm going to be talking specifically about an adaptive reuse initiative uh, that we have going on in Chicago's downtown, which is called The Loop. Um, next slide, please. Uh, it's along our LaSalle uh, corridor. Next slide. And this corridor uh, really, you can see, it's beautiful, iconic architecture, right? And it ends here at the Chicago Board of Trade Building, such a dramatic uh, view and perspective. And this is the financial heart of our city, home of a lot of uh, the banks and uh, diff all different levels of government, the the federal government, state and, and local and Cook County are, are here as well. Um, but the challenges with this corridor is that uh, it truly has an uh, office monoculture. So we looked at all the land uses here and it's predominantly office space. And so this area was struck very hard with the uh, impacts to the pandemic and the age of the buildings. Um, and so we're seeing here record uh, office and retail vacancies compared to other parts of Chicago's downtown. Um, and because of the office monoculture, we also don't have, um, hard, we hardly have any of the buildings um, are residential uses. And so there really are not uh, affordable units in this corridor. And also generally speaking, our loop downtown doesn't have a lot of um, affordable housing options uh, to, to speak of. So this was something we recognized as our challenges. Of course, we have incredible assets in the in the buildings themselves. The um, experience of this this corridor is, is truly memorable, and all of our uh, transit lines uh, merge in the loop. So extremely transit friendly, very close to our uh, signature downtown parks, Millennium Park, very close to the Riverwalk, which is on the north end of this uh, corridor. Uh, and then, um, you know, stones throw away from our theater district as well. Next slide, please. So because of the high vacancies and the age of these buildings, we really felt it was important to uh, provide some city assistance. And we're, we wanted to tackle three uh, issues concurrently. So uh, really the first goal of our initiative is to um, uh, subsidize um, the conversions of these historic buildings and underutilized office space into mixed income housing. And uh, we did set out a requirement that we um, will have 30% of the units on site for affordable uh, household incomes with an average of 60% AMI, which you can see what that income is on the bottom of the slide. At the same time as we're working on this adaptive reuse initiative, 
We also are providing grants for small business improvement funds for locally owned businesses. Uh, and this is a uh, grant program that has been around since 1999 citywide and a few uh, commercial corridors and industrial corridors around our city. But we had not used this grant program in downtown before. So it was the first time we launched this in downtown. We had a first round of applications um, uh, last year, um, we're, we're processing six uh, applications, and then we have another round coming up this September. So we're really excited about uh, trying to address the retail vacancy as well, and these grants go towards permanent improvements uh, for the retail spaces. And uh, we're targeting, of course, um, you know, uses like restaurants, dining, um, cultural uses, that that sort of thing. So um, to really bring more people and, and more eyes on the street. And then our third goal is um, to use our city uh, funds for, to also improve the public realm, right? So the street was designed for this uh, office and banking um, corridor. And so it really, we're trying to uh, provide a more um, welcoming environment, uh, revisiting this. And so we are working, the Department of Planning and Development are collaborating with the Department of Transportation. And uh, we have, um, we're embarking, uh, we, we're in the process of doing a visioning study to identify our priorities uh, for the, the public realm. Uh, and that will inform a future design call for uh, revising the, the street design. Next slide, please. So we didn't come up with this uh, in a vacuum, of course. This was years in the making. Um, we started really in the, in the heart of the pandemic with our central city recovery roadmap. And so this was done virtually with a, a, a several, uh, many uh, Zoom calls with over 150 stakeholders. And we identified 90 action items. And really the key uh, directive here was, you know, we wanted Chicago's downtown to recover quickly out of the pandemic, but we also wanted, did not want to, to return back to the way it was pre-pandemic. We thought this was our opportunity to really make sure downtown was more um, equitable, uh, had improved access to more housing options and more resilient, right? And so our, our real um, uh, key point here is that when you have a mix of uses in a corridor, it does become more resilient and there's more activity beyond the nine to five workday. Uh, and then uh, we use some funding to sponsor the Urban Line Institute to do a technical assistance panel. And they engaged again another 70 stakeholders and they really focused on the LaSalle Street corridor here and they recommended we unlock the tax increment financing as a source of financial assistance for um, adaptive reuse for these uh, historic um, and underutilized vacant office buildings. Um, so that was a great recommendation. We, we completed that in 2022, and then we added some more analysis that we looked at. Um, some of this was done internally, some of this we've shared with the public, um, but as Hunter explained, uh, we did we did a contract with AECOM and their uh, great team of subs, and they provided a market analysis and economic feasibility study, and really they were looking at, you know, is there a market for more residential units in downtown? Uh, for dining, entertainment, and, and cultural uses? And the answer was yes, there is a market for that. But the problem is there's significant gaps when, and they looked at several case studies for us. And there were gaps, as he explained in, in the earlier part of the presentation, there were gaps no matter what range of, from market rate housing to any number of percentage of affordable housing um, percentages. And then uh, there were even gaps if you were keeping the building as an office uh, use, but needing to just bring it up to current standards. Um, so we felt like it was important uh, if we were going to provide city dollars to have a public benefit like affordable housing um, and, and to make downtown uh, more accessible for um, folks with a variety of household incomes. And then we also commissioned uh, uh, Gensler and their team of subs to um, 
provide this uh, adaptive reuse dashboard for us to look at how many buildings in the downtown area would be good candidates for adaptive reuse. Um, and so that was helpful for us just again for internal purposes. Um, as Lyle explained, some of these building owners are quite sensitive to um, not having their tenants um, feel like their, their buildings uh, are in danger. So we did not disclose this publicly. Next, next slide. So we launched the initiative in September 22. And uh, we did do a lot of um, in engagement before we launched it. So we had support from the local community groups and the uh, elected officials. Um, and we we issued an invitation for proposals, really, and because uh, none the buildings are all privately owned, um, and so we wanted to make sure that uh, there was interest, and uh, we very clearly laid out our requirements, and we received um, nine responses uh, right uh, at the end of December, uh, worth over a billion dollars in total project costs, costs, which is great. We did quickly um, revise that. A response amount to uh, six proposals that we continue to evaluate. Three were just not uh, really, one withdrew, one was not eligible, and one was too small. So we just uh, continued our evaluation with six. So next slide, please. Here you can see uh, we are proceeding with four projects. And we even last month, uh, our Community Development Commission approved uh, $151 million in tax increment finance, financing uh, subsidies for the four projects. The four projects in terms of total project costs um, are um, combined to be $525 million. Uh, and it they are going to reactivate and convert 1.3 million square feet of vacant office space. So a significant amount of vacant office space in the corridor. And we'll provide over a thousand new residential units here, including over 300 uh, affordable units. Um, and this is a range of affordability with an average of 60% AMI and creating over 800 construction jobs at the same time. And so these are being, um, the next step would be uh, city council approval for each of these projects. And then we're hoping to close on the transactions for at least a couple of them by the end of this year, starting construction early next year, and then start leasing in the first quarter of 2026. So we're really trying to move as quickly as possible on these four projects. Um, highlighted on this slide, we have two more projects that are grayed out here, 135 South LaSalle and 105 West Adams. Those uh, we we are um, continuing to evaluate uh, their uh, those proposals with the developers. They have not yet proceeded through the legislative process, but we are hopeful that they will be able to uh, continue working with us. And then highlighted in. Uh, purple at the bottom of this slide here is the Thompson Center, which is is a great um, postmodern building designed by Helmut Jan, and it was owned by the state and had severe maintenance issues for many, many years, but it's a beloved building uh, in the city of Chicago. And uh, it was a wonderful announcement uh, a couple of years ago that uh, Google will be moving in and creating a new um, uh, headquarters there. So thousands of new jobs. Uh, of course, the full rehabilitation of the building, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so we're really excited about that momentum on the north end of this corridor. And then another um, exciting news, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but over here is the Chase Tower. And they also recently announced um, millions of dollars of investment to uh, improve and, and retain their employees uh, in this building. Next slide. So I'll just go through the four projects that are proceeding. Um, we have a slide for each one of them. 111 West Monroe, this is being developed by Prime Group and Capri Interest. Capri actually is a, a black owned entity. So that's also exciting for us that we have a minority um, development as, as part of this partnership. Um, so this project is, um, you can see it's kind of two buildings combined. They share the same floor plate, but they were built at different times. And they are going to be uh, designating these buildings as a Chicago landmark as part of our um, deal terms. Um, and they're converting uh, over, over 610,000 square feet, which is a pretty incredible size. <laughs> 
Um, and this will cost, uh, the project cost will be $203 million, uh, including a $40 million uh, tax increment financing assistance. The buildings are also uh, listed on the National Register, so they are being um, the developers tapping the 20% federal re rehabilitation tax credit, which is an important source for this project. Um, they're creating a new ground floor lobby, of course, and you can see the number of units, 300, almost 350 apartments with 105 affordable units. This building will also include a small hotel with 226 hotel keys, um, some basement uh, parking spaces. Uh, even though parking is not required in downtown either, um, this was uh, because their basement levels existed already. Uh, the, the developer uh, felt it was important to provide some uh, basement parking options. Uh, and then the roof top will be um, reactivated with a new uh, club with uh, beverage uh, and dining options. So really exciting. This is a complicated uh, construction project too, because the floor plates were so large, they actually have to carve out a light well a courtyard inside the building. So, uh, you know, this is part of the reason why costs are so high. Next slide. This is 208 South LaSalle. This is also a project um, proposed by Prime Group, being developed by Prime Group. Uh, total project costs are $122 million with a uh, tax increment uh, financing subsidy of $26 million. Um, this is a very large building with an existing courtyard space already. Um, and the conversion is for 180,000 square feet. There's five levels of office space in sandwiched in the middle of two hotels in this building. So that's how large this building is. There's already two hotels here. Um, and so this uh, conversion of the office levels will create 226 apartments with 68 of the units being affordable. Um, one of the, you know, they'll, they'll have a new ground floor lobby for the residential uses and a new restaurant at the corner. And of course, they'll have all the tenant amenities, fitness center, lounge, meeting spaces, which every tenant could access equally, um, no matter if it's the affordable unit or the market rate unit. Um, and as I said, the two hotels will remain. Um, both of these two projects that I explained, uh, they are asking for TIF subsidies, but they're also going after additional uh, incentives, including uh, low-income housing tax credits, the 4% low-income housing tax credits, and the associated tax exempt bonds uh, that are part of those tax credits. Next slide, please. This is a, a building built in the 1970s, so one of our younger <laughs> buildings in the mix, um, but it's Kitty Corner to City Hall, and half the building is vacant. It's an office building. Half the building is vacant. They are keeping all of the office tenants um, that are, are, uh, are there still, but the top half of the building will be uh, will be retained as office, and then the bottom half would be converted into residential units. So truly mixed use, same as the other projects. Um, and so this would be $130 million in total project costs uh, and a slightly higher TIF request because this project is not um, layering other financial incentives. It's not a historic building, so it couldn't get the historic tax credits. Um, and they were also not able to uh, consider uh, the low-income housing tax credits either for other reasons, um, but this would... Uh, provide a lobby. And this is one of the few projects that has a plaza as well that really needs improvement. So they are going to improve the plaza as part of this project. They'll create uh, tenant amenity floors. You can see that um, being uh, cantilevered out a little bit. And you can see the plaza improvements proposed as part of the project. Um, next slide, please. And this is the last one out of the four, 79 West Monroe. It's much smaller than the other projects. So, you know, in some cases, yes, it's expensive when you have a large project, but it's also expensive when you have a small project because, um, you know, you, you it, it just is all projects are, all conversion <laughs> projects are expensive is I guess the, the lesson learned here. And the developer here is Brown Derby from the Campari Group, uh, $64 million in total, uh, total project costs. And the TIF request here is $28 million in TIF. This one is going to also become a Chicago landmark as part of the development deal. 
uh, just under 100,000 square feet here. Um, and we would have 117 apartments with 41 affordable units. So this project is actually doing 35% of the units as affordable. Uh, we'll create a great new amenity deck. And there's actually a high school, a charter high school on the lower levels of this floor from two to six, and they will be retaining um, that high school as well as the uh, pharmacy tenant that's already there. Next slide. So goal two, again, was our uh, reactivating vacant uh, retail spaces. And so this is our small business improvement fund grant. And uh, we've allocated over $107 million throughout the city of Chicago since 1999. Um, but we uh, started this downtown one for the LaSalle corridor um, in 2023. Uh, and we've got six projects that we're processing through that grant application project. Uh, one of them is a museum, then there are five restaurants um, and the grant provides up to $250,000 uh, per uh, and permanent improvement uh, retail space, which is great. Next slide. And then of course, we're doing this uh, visioning work uh, with the Department of Transportation. Uh, we expect to complete that work by the end of this year. Uh, Department of Transportation is also doing an engineering assessment at the same time. And then we hope to start the design process next year. And then I'll turn it back to Jason. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, a quick note, we still, we're still still continuing to get some great questions in the Q&A and working to answer them. Um, the next speaker we have up for the session is Debbie Bingham. Debbie was hired 16 years ago by the City of Tacoma's Community and Economic Development Department. In her current role as a Business and Economic Development Program Manager, Debbie plays a pivotal role in fostering economic growth and investment in Tacoma. Collaborating closely with the development community and businesses, she spearheads initiatives aimed at attracting investment and job opportunities to the city. Cindy, thanks, or Debbie, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> so um, um, good morning. I'm Debbie Bingham, as I said, with the city of Tacoma, and I'm excited to share with you Tacoma's ex um, approach and experience with office to or, or converting office to housing. The next slide um, shows just a little bit interesting to point out up front. Um, Tacoma is a <clears throat> much smaller city than Chicago or Seattle. And um, <clears throat> so we have some different circumstances to work with. Over the past five to seven years, Tacoma has seen a lot of housing development downtown, um, even during the pandemic. And a lot of that is our cost, our lower cost of living and the lifestyle um, that's easier to access and <clears throat> attain in Tacoma. Um, we and we've so we've been attracting a lot of um, folks who are living in larger cities to come live in Tacoma. During the pandemic, we saw a large influx of people who could now work remotely um, and live somewhere they could afford. So since 2020, we've had uh, 2,500 units built in our downtown, and uh, we currently have 4,000 units under construction or in permitting. And we've been working hard, just like we heard from Chicago, um, to make sure that a portion of those units are available to um, people of all income levels. So we, we are really focusing on that 70% AMI in Tacoma. Um, the other um, difference is as a smaller city, we have more office buildings that are mixed tenants. Um, and so we don't have a lot of fully unoccupied office buildings. Um, we have some that are a lot that are kind of partially full. So the next um, slide, I'm just gonna go through four projects that either have already occurred or are in the process. Um, and the first one is um, the Washington building. So none of these projects has the city been proactively looking for developers. Developers are coming to us, owners are coming to us and saying they want to do this. Uh, this building was built originally in 1925 and it housed a lot of small companies and medical offices. So a lot were just like individual offices throughout the building. In 2017, it was purchased for $9.8 million with the intention of converting it to housing. Um, the retrofit took a little bit longer than expected, a lot to do with um, the necessary seismic upgrades as well as the pandemic. But the um, final, with a final total construction cost of 55 million, the building opened in 2022, has 15 studios, 118 one beds, and 23 two beds, and it's at full capacity. Um, this building is right downtown on Pacific Avenue, which is our core that runs through downtown. It's got um, retail on the bottom floor, a really nice matcha shop, 
um, and, and the rest is all housing. Uh, the project did use Opportunity Zone funding. We um, we tried really hard and got Opportunity Zone in our downtown core, so that funding was available for this project, as well as the um, multifamily property tax exemption and historic tax credits. So with those two tax credits layered, this um, pro property is now paying zero property taxes, which helps a lot with their financing. The next um, slide shows just some interior photos. It's kind of cool. So at one point there was obviously a bank in this building. So they, they turned the vault um, into a community space for the residents. So the um, what top photo shows the interior of the vault. And then they also had, there used to be a restaurant at the top floor way back when, and uh, they converted that into another um, amenity space for the residents. The um, next slide shows the second project was the, which used to be the headquarters for Davida Company. Um, this slowly, this company slowly transitioned their headquarters to a building in Federal Way, and um, has been unoccupied for the last several years. And the current owner has plans to convert this to 75 residential units. And they're um, in, talking to our permitting and going through that process. The next um, slide is the Tacoma Towers. This project is um, in permitting and in demo phase at the moment. Um, this um, project combines two historic buildings um, and that were built around 1912. The taller building constructed, which was in 1912, was the tallest building in the state until the Smith Tower was built in Seattle in 1914. Um, the plan for this space would be office, um, can keep the office on floors two, three, and four, and the top 12 floors, which were office, would be converted to 60 residential units. Um, there's also a seven-story parking structure in the back, which would have 211 spaces and 11,000 square feet of ground floor retail and a food hall. Um, and this project is currently, like I said, in permitting, but also still working to put together their financing. But they had, but the building has been purchased. Um, the next, the last one um, is the True Blue building. So this building um, used to hold four to 500 employees before the pandemic every day. Now all but about 50 work remotely. So um, they are looking to sell that building and keep their headquarters in Tacoma, but um, occupy a different building. So this building was originally built in 1910 as Warehouser Company's headquarters and um, was used as such until they moved to their headquarters in Federal Way in the early 1970s. And then they were re retained ownership until 2000 when it sold to True Blue. This project is under contract to become a mixed income, um, mixed use project. They are still looking to put together their financial package um, and trying to figure out how to fill the gap that they, they uh, know is coming. So um, thanks so much for having Tacoma tell our story and I'm happy to answer questions when we get there. Great. Thank you, Debbie, for that perspective on a city, you know, smaller than a Seattle or a Chicago. And I know we have a lot of folks from outside of the region that are joining us. Tacoma is a city about 30 miles south on Interstate 5 uh, from, from the city of Seattle. So our next or our last speaker, our last formal speaker today is Michael Poe. Mike is the Senior Director of Research at Main Street America, where he develops research projects that demonstrate the power and potential of Main Street communities across the country. In his prior role at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Mike led research assessing the contributions that existing buildings and commercial districts offer cities and played a significant role in the Trust's partnership for building reuse with the Urban Lands Institute. So thank you for joining us, Mike. Thank you for having me, Jason. Yeah, I'll be real quick here because I want to make sure there's time for Q&A. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a different slideshow. I don't think I have as many projects to showcase other than a tool that we've built. Um, so Main Street is pretty different than Seattle, Chicago, and Tacoma. We do have uh, some of our Main Street districts in big cities, um, but in general, we're across the country in a lot of small towns and rural places. Um, housing and vacancy circumstances, though, are, are pretty similar to what we see in those cities, so we'll be talking about that. Uh, second main point I want to show here is that um, Knowing the basics with housing, if you're unfamiliar, if you're not um, haven't don't have a history with housing development, is really really half the battle. More than half the battle, um, we've kind of seen that knowing your local assets, if you're in a smaller town or rural place, is really really important. We've tried to help that. 
And then lastly, just the opportunities, the challenges and the opportunities in Main Street districts are huge. And I'll kind of quantify that a little bit and speak to that. Go to the next slide. So just a few words about Main Street America. So our mission really is to lead an inclusive, impact-driven movement dedicated to re-energizing re and strengthening older and historic downtowns and neighborhood commercial districts across the country. And we have about 1,200 some odd places that are officially in our network across the US. And you can see the dots on the map there. Um, the vast majority of these, so 60% so of these are in places that are described as rural by their local directors. About half are outside metropolitan counties. So we're talking about, yeah, some places that are not like Seattle, uh, Chicago, and Tacoma. Um, you can imagine probably in your minds what a Main Street district looks like. It's predominantly one to four story older mixed use and commercial buildings. Um, we'll talk more about those buildings in just a moment. And just another word. So, you know, if you're in a smaller community, Main streets tend to be, uh, I think 90% of them are either nonprofit organizations or part of a city planning department or a, a town's planning department. Um, two thirds are just a single full-time staff person. Um, something like, I think half the programs have a budget of $150,000 or less a year. So these are really kind of skeleton crews that are doing incredible work. Um, so if you feel like you're in a, a, a city planning office that doesn't have enormous capacity to think about, um, you know, code challenges and, and, and things like that. In the same way, I think we kind of feel your pain and, and we're working through that together. If you go to the next slide, please. So we've done a lot of work over the last few years on housing for Main Street America, a couple of reports, a couple of tools, and I'll be talking more about those. In the next slide, I'll, I'll highlight one in particular. So Last year, we published this um, At Home on Main Street, that's the name of our overall sort of project, but a guidebook for local leaders. So we really tried to write like a 101, 102 level um, book on places where to get started, what are the first steps you could take if you're kind of new to this kind of work, um, ways you might take stock of your housing assets or promote housing potential in your community, some like 101 level financing sources and terms to know, how to deal with codes and regs. So whether you yourself feel like um, you could use a little refresh or could use some, some training on this, um, or if you know folks who are working in like a downtown organization like a Main Street, um, you can point folks to this resource. It's, it's free and available on our website. Um, and this quote, who is one of our people we talked to, Sherry Early at the Incremental Development Alliance, also known as InkDev, said, you know, folks don't need to be experts in all the types of buildings and all the types of developers and development. You just got to know some general trends. Let's go to the next slide, please. Some key takeaways we learned through the course of this research, doing surveys, doing focus groups, kind of having a lot of different engagements. Um, one, there's not enough housing to accommodate those who want to live on main streets. We heard from, they heard that seven in eight Main Street leaders felt like housing is a concern in their district, in their community. Three quarters of Main Street directors said there wasn't enough housing to accommodate those who wanted to live there. Um, and we also see at the same time, there's huge amounts of significant uh, uh, of vacant space in older and historic buildings. And these really location efficient, these really like incredibly desirable locations uh, on the whole. 90% um, of our Main Street directors said they have vacant buildings or upper floors in their district, and about half of those districts said they have a half dozen or more buildings that are vacant, half dozen or more buildings that have vacant upper floors. So really great locations, really great need for housing, and yet a lot of vacant space. So we started to see that information, understanding that challenge is a really important way to attack it. You know, if you look at CoStar, used to like these national data sets about um, vacancy, about commercial buildings, that information is really, really pretty shoddy, pretty, pretty uh, crummy when it comes to small towns, these individually owned um, older and historic buildings. So we've seen that the information is really only accessible locally, but obviously it could be helpful at a broader scale. Go to the next slide. So that's where we built something we call the Booms Tracker. Uh, BOOMS stands, it's in addition to being kind of a fun name, it stands for Building Opportunities on Main Street. And this is a tool that's made to kind of track those, um, those opportunities, to track those spaces. We're really trying to take care to position, as in the name, vacant spaces as opportunities for additional housing, additional commercial space. It could be offices, it could be whatever. 
But some of the stuff that Lyle showed earlier, that that image of the building in, in Pioneer Square that's sitting vacant, but looks beautiful. It's got great historic characters and a great location. We're trying to position a lot of these buildings in these small towns as this kind of opportunity. Let's go to the next slide. I think I just have a couple images. So the Booms Tracker enables accessible and updatable information at the local level. We built this for lo these local Main Street directors to use on their smartphones as they're walking the district. They tap on a property. They answer a half dozen questions or so about the property. It takes a minute or two. They can go on to the next property. They can uh, take a get an inventory, an updated inventory of their entire district in a matter of, of days pretty, pretty easily. If you go to the next slide, too, so we've also built a dashboard for every single Main Street organization to showcase the real data and opportunities for housing or other kinds of development in their districts. This is something we imagine folks could show to their city officials, they could show to developers, they could show to entrepreneurs who are interested in buying a building or opening a, a commercial uh, business in one of the spaces. Um, Fifty thousand properties. If you could advance to the next one, thank you. Um, about five hundred fifty thousand properties across the United States, across our network. Um, we've seen so far. I've had about thirty three hundred properties entered. I think it's a little bit more than that. It goes up every day, um, and we're seeing potential for about fourteen hundred housing units within those spaces. If we project that rate from those 3,300 parcels in this, you know, 60 some odd communities, uh, we see potential for 225,000 housing units across the network. And that's the number I really like have to sit back. Um, the chance to have that kind of investment in local economies uh, in these downtowns and these small, small towns, I think is, is just really uh, significant. We've done some like really rough back of the napkin, you know, uh, um, estimates of what the local economic impact would be across those places. Obviously, it would be expensive. Obviously, it's just a thought exercise. But looking at like five and a half to six billion dollars in local economic impacts in these small districts. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Yeah, I'm just my closing note here. So this might sound, you know, like we're talking about these small towns. Maybe you're from big cities, or maybe you're from a place like this. We are interested in building Booms Tracker, expanding it to include more users, more places. Um, you don't have to be part of the Main Street America network. You don't have to be a Main Street. Uh, just email us at research at mainstreet.org if you're interested in getting added to the Booms Tracker. We're looking to build this to a much uh, broader array of places. We're just looking at you know downtowns and commercial districts. We're also looking to add refinements to the dashboards and the survey questions to help get um, the best data we can. And I'll highlight just the last point, the best data we can to say, like some of the questions that have been coming up in the chat, issues with fire suppression, issues with means of egress, where we can start to identify what specific challenges will come up for these buildings. We're hoping to kind of leverage that and use that as a tool to advocate for code challenges, code reform, um, to advocate for investment in those places. We see this is an incredible opportunity. So. That's my that's my bit. Um, thanks, folks. Thank you, Mike. So I would love to invite, <clears throat> excuse me, all of our panelists to turn their cameras on. Um, we'll spend a few minutes uh, addressing some questions. Uh, the first one, we've got a lot of questions submitted beforehand, and then today, a lot of them focusing on financing and the challenges around financing. So Hunter, I'm going to kick this one over to you first and then others can jump in as appropriate. It's clear that getting these projects to pencil out financially is a key hurdle to being able to have a successful project in a community. So what do you see as being the most important financial tools to date and or what types of new financial tools would we like to see in order to help make these projects possible? Totally, yeah. So um, I, I kind of glazed over this in my, in my slide deck uh, at the beginning of this, uh, so I'll touch on it again. Uh, but there, there is a list in there that I'm going to kind of work off of. Um, so there's, I would say, there's two kind of categories of things that these financial incentives are financial incentives are tied to. It's just stimulating the conversion projects themselves, or it's encouraging the development of affordable housing. Those are kind of the two buckets that I think of um, that are each attached to various financial incentives. So. Um, 
in the, the kind of conversion incentive program bucket, you have property tax abatements. A lot of cities are offering property tax abatements. Um, Chicago has one that's sort of more related to the affordable housing bucket, um, but they uh, most of the time are more tied to the conversion side. I believe um, I believe uh, there was mention of one in, in the Tacoma presentation as well. Um, so that's, that's a really common one. Second one is historic tax credits. Um, that of course is tied to the conversion that's a federal historic tax credit program um, that can account for 12 to 15% of total project costs. So it's a pretty significant incentive. Um, and several states also have state level historic tax credit programs as well. Uh, there's a variety of like soft financing or below market rate loans that are available for these types of projects or tax exempt bond financing, depending on the city or state's capacity to issue those bonds that we've seen used. Uh, tax increment financing, as Cindy mentioned, was is one that, that we've been using here in Chicago, and I know it's pretty popular in a lot of other places as well. Um, there's a variety of grant programs uh, that I probably won't go into because there's so many to list. Uh, and then there's federal TOD funding, um, programs like RIF uh, and TIFIA uh, through the Build America Bureau and, and Department of Transportation have been things that we've had conversations about. Um, so those are kind of all of the ones that come to mind. And then on the affordable housing side, there's probably a lot of ones that are local specific, but the big one is the low income housing tax credit. Um, this I think funds like 90 or 95% of affordable housing nationwide. Um, We've seen a lot of 4% LIHTC being used. 9% uh, LIHTC may or may not be applicable depending on local regulations. Um, but those are those are some of the big financial incentives that we've seen. Great, thanks Hunter. That's pretty comprehensive. Somebody has anything else they wanna add real quickly, feel free to jump in. Cindy, I see your mic's live. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree, Hunter's um, uh, response was great. I do wanna put in, a mention that the there's federal pending federal legislation called Revitalizing Downtowns Act. Uh, and this is legislation that would provide additional tax credits to convert vacant um, commercial space into mixed income housing. So this, of course, is dependent on um, the, the federal process, but, uh, you know, it would, it would be helpful, I think, for uh, the legislators to hear from a variety of municipalities and stakeholders um, that this incentive would really help um, spread the burden across um, multiple levels of government in terms of making projects, um, you know, getting projects to the finish line in terms of penciling out. Great. Thanks, Cindy. We're getting a couple of questions in the Q&A. People are hoping for links to resources. So we'll aggregate some information and we'll send a follow-up to the group uh, with some additional resources and links that can be useful. Um, I'm going to do maybe just a, a wrap up with a lightning round. We hit our attendees with a lot of information, lots of folks coming in from very different perspectives. So if you could give a each give or most of you give a kind of a one sentence you know, where to start. Some of these folks are coming in because they don't necessarily have projects right now, but are looking to, to get started with all the challenges and the partnerships that, that are needed. Uh, what What's a first step that they could take? I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I do Thanks, think, um, Jason, that Cindy talked about it, but finding those partnerships, I mean, finding building owners who are willing to sell or were willing to work with you, maybe, you know, proactively going and saying, hey, I see you have 30% vacancy. What if we partner on a project? Um, I think just looking for those and, and like everyone said, be creative. You know, there's a lot of Tacoma has a, you know, one tenth of one percent sales tax that goes to affordable housing. Look for all the different resources that you can use to make those projects pencil. But I do think finding that the project team, you know, is is super important first step. I'll jump in. Um, when we talk about adaptive reuse, I would love to see a resurrection of the single room occupancy model that we used to have. They got a bad reputation for being uh, sketchy, squalid, hazardous, but uh, uh, SRO 2.0 could be a great way to um, not only do a successful um, um, adaptive reuse, um, but provide the kind of co-living uh, space. Someone asked, uh, Carol, you asked whether 
Um, there's a demand for that. There absolutely is. We had a micro housing um, kind of solution a, a little while back, but it was basically people just gaming the land use code. I think if you could bring out an actual, um, you know, properly developed uh, SRO model, it could really get at this a whole affordability problem in a super smart way. Thanks, Lyle. So we've asked a lot of our panelists today. Uh, we have contact information for them, which we will share. Feel free to reach out to them, uh, work with them, partner with them as needed. Uh, thanks again to all of our panelists for coming. Thanks you all for attending. I'm going to hand it over to, you're welcome to turn your cameras off. I'm going to hand it over to Katie to handle some of the, the end, end administration here of the, of the session. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, and once again, I, I just want to echo Jason and really give a big shout out and thank you to our wonderful panelists. Um, you all shared so much information and it's been a pleasure to coordinate this webinar and bring you all together today. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask Michaela to launch our final end of session evaluation questions. Um, so you can take a moment to answer those while I just go over a couple final announcements. First of all, I just wanted to remind you all about our two upcoming sessions. We have the transit-oriented community session at the end of September and the commercial displacement prevention in the beginning of November. So keep your eyes peeled for some announcements on those. And then also I just wanted to circle back to our AICP credit information. So if you'll be claiming one of those AICP credits, you can go in your dashboard and find the session either using the bolded um, session title or the ID 9293153. Um, finally, when you leave the session today, we just have our Title VI requirements, so you're not um, required to fill out that poll, but it would be helpful if you don't mind giving us that information. Finally, just a big thank you to all of you for sticking around, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Friday. Thank you. Goodbye.